Find your place in the Bible at uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 8. 1 Samuel chapter number 8. I'll be right back. We'll see what the Lord has for us here in 1 Samuel chapter number 8 this morning. And uh, I'll tell you, we were... Uh, last night we were... Uh, we went over to... Uh, some of Nicole's family, they uh, they always put on a big 4th of July thing and uh, went over there and, and was uh, watched some fireworks and uh, they had just some stuff for the kids to do and had some fellowship and really had a good time. And, you know, I sat there and they had a projector and they was playing some, uh, playing some music and playing some videos and things like that and and uh, you know your typical patriotic stuff you know I'm proud to be an American and and uh, things like that and by the way I am proud to be an American uh, if you're not then nobody's forcing you to live here uh, but anyways I wish a lot of people would understand that especially people in Hollywood and a lot of the liberals around if you hate this country so much you don't have to be here and uh, anyways, I, I know a lot of people think that's mean, but is it not the truth? Uh, and uh, it is free country. And uh, I tell you what, uh, a lot of people died. A lot of people fought hard to have the freedom that we have. And it's so sad that it's, it's so under attack the way that it is and uh, in the day that we live and uh, to think that uh, all of the lives and all of the uh, the blood that's been shed for the freedom that we have and, and people just don't care anymore that's a sad sad commentary and uh, we went we was down there and I was sitting there and we was and we was enjoying the fireworks and we was watching the kids play and run around with their little glow sticks and bracelets on and and uh, you know I thought man <coughs> It sure is good to be free. It sure is good to be free. And uh, it is. It sure is. I, I, I sat there and I started thinking and uh, uh, I, they had me come up and pray over everything. And, and as I was praying, I was sitting there thinking, <coughs> I think I swallowed a fly right there. Give me just a second. I started thinking, Man, it sure is good to be free. We're <coughs> to live in a country where, <coughs> well, <coughs> let's do this again. <coughs> Has that ever happened to y'all? <coughs> <coughs> I'm gonna say it if it kills me, so they might as well leave me alone. Uh, I started sitting there and I was just looking around and I thought, man, it sure is good to be free. I was watching the kids play, I was watching the fireworks, we was getting ready and, and I thought, you know, there's a lot of countries in this world that can't have this. They don't have this. They're not allowed to have this. And then my mind started thinking, there's a lot of places in America right now that are not allowed to have this. And that's sad. That's sad. I read a story just in Richmond, Virginia. Construction company up there. They put up a big flag on the side of the construction site city of Richmond made them take it down. You know why? They said that they were afraid that it would be a target for protest. They were afraid that it might would be a target for a riot because of that massive flag on the side. They made them take it down. My thoughts was, is why don't you take those rioters and protesters and put them in jail? Why is it, why is it that the logic in our day is, let's take the American flag down and let everybody that hates it have their way? That's sad this morning. That's sad today. We're seeing that happen all over America. 
I'm thankful last night though. I got to sit down with my children. I got to sit down with my family. We got to watch some fireworks. We got to talk to some friends and some family. We got to listen to some music and watch some videos and have a good time. We got to pray out in the open. I'm thankful this morning that I'm able to preach out in the open. It's not like that everywhere. We don't need to take that for granted, folks. How blessed we truly are. How blessed we really are. And, you know, like I said, we're, we're seeing a backwards trend in America. There's people fighting to get rid of our rights. There's people fighting to get rid of our freedom. You know, the Bible still says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And if the nation whose God is the Lord is a blessed nation, then the opposite must be true. If God is not the Lord of the nation, then it's not going to be a blessed nation today. And can I say this morning that without God, nobody, no nation, no people, no nothing has any freedom whatsoever. And my friend, when you turn your back on God, whether you do it individually, you do it as a family, you do it as a church, because sadly we do have churches turning their backs on God, or you do it as a nation, you will not, you will not prosper. You will lose freedom. And we find an example of that in the Word of God. That's what we're going to look at this morning here in 1 Samuel chapter number 8. Now to give you some history leading up to what's going on right here, thank you all for praying that fly went down by the way. I think I'm good now. But to give you some history of what's going on right here in 1 Samuel chapter number 8 before we get to this point, Samuel was the last judge to judge Israel. And the story of the judges, and you've heard me preach on judges before, you've heard me preach about Samson before, and you know that it's an endless cycle of sin followed by judgment, judgment followed by repentance, repentance followed by deliverance, and deliverance followed by a period of peace. But they would just keep repeating that and repeating that and repeating that. And God raised up judges to deliver His people, to rule over His people in peace. And the judge would lead or judge Israel, bringing peace throughout His lifetime. But when the judge would die, the people would return to their sin. And so this cycle would begin all over again. The book of Judges outlines the cycle in Judges chapter number 2, verses 10 through 19. And this then becomes the framework for the rest of the story. And when you read through 1 Samuel chapters number 4 through chapter number 7, you see the same pattern as you do back in the book of Judges. Sin leads to judgment in uh, uh, first, uh, or chapters 4 through 6. And then the people repent. God raises up Samuel as a judge in 1 Samuel chapter number 7, verse number 6. And then Samuel the judge delivers Israel, and as a result they enjoy peace throughout his lifetime according to 1 Samuel chapter number 7, verses 13 and 14. And then in verse number 15, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, it tells us that Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Now, 20 to 25 years pass between chapter 7 and chapter number 8. And uh, in chapter number 8, a great change occurs for Samuel and the nation of Israel. That's where we're at this morning. I want to I preach about some truths concerning a nation that rejected God. And my friend, it's never a good idea to reject God. We're going to just go down through this chapter this morning and look at exactly what happens to a nation that rejects God. I want you to notice, look in chapter number 8, the first few verses. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, took bribes, and perverted judgment. 
You see, Samuel here, and he's getting older. The best guess is that he's probably around 60 years old. And Samuel was one of the godliest men you find in the entire Bible. Yet his actions right here may be a sin on his part. The reason I say that is, look at what verse number 1 says. It says, He made His sons judges over Israel. I want you to notice right there that there's no mention of prayer involving that. There's no mention of scriptural support involving that. The judges were not to be supported or appointed because of hereditary. Uh, just because they were His sons did not mean that they automatically became judges when He got old. That's not how it worked. My friend, we need to forget that we ought to go to God always with decisions. And right here, right off the bat, we find that it simply says He made His sons judges over Israel. Verse 2 tells us who the boys are. And verse 3 tells us something very interesting. It tells us that they didn't walk in His ways. That pretty much means that they didn't believe like He did. They didn't think like He did. As a matter of fact, it even gives us a few details. It goes forward and says that they turned aside after filthy lucre. They took bribes. They perverted judgment. Can I just put it this way? They were wicked. They were bad news. As a matter of fact, they had no business judging Israel because they needed somebody to judge them. I thought about what Brother Shoemate said the other night, last Sunday night, when he was uh, preaching concerning the children that he was ministering to. He referenced a verse over in Judges chapter 2. I referenced it a while ago, and I'm going to quote it. It says in verse number 10 of Judges 2, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which He had done for Israel. My friend, can I tell you one of the reasons why America is in such a mess that it is is because there has been a generation that was brought up without the knowledge of God. And then there's been another generation that was brought up. And each generation seems that it just gets further and further and further away from the truths that we used to hold so dear. And why is that? Could it be that the parents at some point in time did not hold those truths so dear? You see, it's been said that one generation wins the battle. Another generation claims the spoils. And then, uh, and then the third generation will waste it and all goes back into the hands of the enemy. How can I say such a thing? Because it's what happens. It's called history. Then we've got it in the Bible also. And my friend, that's why it's so important as parents that we do everything that we can to instill these truths into our children. Even as grandparents to instill, instill these truths into our grandchildren. You never know what difference you'll make in somebody's life. It's like brother... Shumate was saying so many of those children that he ministers to don't even know who Jesus is. They don't even know the story from the Bible that Jesus loved them. And the reason why they do what they do is because of sin. So many generations now don't know that. All they seem to know is they want their way. And if they can't have their way, then you better watch out. Just turn on the news if you don't believe that. Such a selfish people nowadays. Remember, sin always seems to come with a snowball effect. A chain reaction, a reaction so to speak. It starts with one thing, and then it just keeps growing. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about a nation, whether you're talking about your personal life, family, church, whatever it is. It's obvious that it began here with a spiritual decline. Samuel missed it when he chose to just appoint his sons. Didn't pray about it. Didn't seek the will of God about it. So he appointed his sons, which were as wicked as they could be, to judge Israel. So that led to another problem. That, that 
we see the spiritual decline, but then we see that that led to a sinful demand. Look in verses 4 and 5. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel under Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. Thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. You see, Samuel's boys being crooks and thieves caused a problem for the elders of the nation of Israel. The elders of Israel got together. And this time, there was scriptural, scriptural support for what they did. But we still don't see them praying. You still don't see them seeking the will of God here. They get together. They tell Samuel, look man, you're old. Your sons, they're not right. They don't walk the same way you do. They don't believe the same way you do. It's time that you anoint a king to judge us. Now listen, there's no doubt they had a right to discuss the condition of Israel. They, they had a right to discuss the condition of Samuel's boys and the situation the nation was in. But something needed to be done. Absolutely something needed to be done. But the answer was not a king. While it was wise for the leaders of Israel or the elders of Israel here to reject Samuel's sons as leaders, it was wrong for them to say what they did. Notice the reasoning here. What is it they told him? Make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. Like all the nations. Can I just tell you that was no reason at all. And, the, and oftentimes you and I, even as Christians today, we get into trouble by wanting to be like the world when we should instead be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 12 still tells us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the will of God for your Christians? to not be conformed to this world. That's what it says in one verse right there. Listen, Israel was supposed to be a nation whose behavior was governed by God's ruling Word. But instead, their behavior is governed by what other people were doing. They were supposed to be different. They were supposed to be distinct. They were supposed to be holy. But instead, they want to be the same. They wanted to conform. They wanted to fit in with the rest of the world. They were supposed to be a light to all the other nations revealing the righteousness of God's rule, but instead of the nations learning from Israel, Israel was learning from the other nations. That was a problem. And my friend, that's a problem with a lot of churches today. You're never going to win the world by being just like the world. If you believe that, then you're just deceived. We had three messages, three weeks on that. You're falling into the devil's trap if you think you've got to be like the world in order to win the world. You ain't going to win somebody on a bar stool. Ain't never seen anybody go down to the bar and pass out tracks. They're going to wonder what you're doing there. I think a lot more times than not, some people out in the world's got more sense than some people in the church do nowadays. Everybody wants to be just like the world and yet still win the world. That's not what the Bible says though. And whatever you do, if it hey, I'll just say this, if it goes against the Word of God, it will always go against the will of God. Every single time doesn't matter what you're thinking about. doesn't matter what you're talking about. You know why we got such a mess that we do a lot of times in churches and in a lot of homes? It's because people don't read the Bible. People don't pray. 
People don't seek the will of God. They're just like Samuel right here. They're just like the elders. We don't find any evidence of scriptural support. We don't find any evidence of prayer. And my friend, when you do that, you may not think what you may not think on the surface of what you're doing, but what you are doing is rejecting God. And it will not lead anywhere but down. It'll hurt you. It led to destruction. It led to a downfall. They were rejecting God. You see what started for Samuel here as a problem of sustained leadership turned into a problem of sinful leadership and has now become a problem of suspended leadership. And now, now that we've already went through these steps of sin, we find Him going to God in prayer. And you know what happens? Look in verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. That's the first sign of prayer in this whole passage. All this stuff has already been done. Appointed new king, a new judge. Two new judges that were wicked as all get out. And then the elders say, hey, we want a king which went right against the Word of God. And if it goes against the Word of God, it's against the will of God. And now we're at a point where we finally find Samuel praying. And you know what happened when Samuel did pray? We find in his retirement years, we find a better pastor, we find a better preacher, we find a better spiritual leader, we find a better trainer of young preachers than ever before. And you know why we find that in Samuel's later life? It's because he took the spiritual approach. And if you're not praying, if you're not seeking the will of God in your life, then you're not going to get anywhere with it. But the time when you finally get to the point when you get your eyes on God, when you get your eyes back in the book of God, when you get in the Word of God, when you start reading and start seeking the will of God by reading His Word and, and praying, then you'll do something. That's the lesson right there. Even Samuel was learning it right here. One of the godliest men in all the Bible was learning that lesson. Look at what Samuel does. He prays, and then we find the sovereign decision. Look at verses. The next few verses here. And the Lord said unto Samuel, verse 7, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Verse 8 says, According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. See, on the surface, I already mentioned it. These people looked like they were rejecting Samuel. Did it not? Samuel, you're old. Your sons, they don't walk in your ways. Give us a king. Samuel goes to God. He starts praying. They're rejecting me, God. God looks at him. Yep, on the surface, they're, reje they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. Can I say, when you get what you want, that's what God says right here. He tells Samuel, give them what they want. They're rejecting me. Give them what they want. My friend, can I tell you, when you get what you want, you better be careful what you ask for. A king was not God's first choice for His people. And God even goes on here in the next section, tells them how difficult it's going to be for them. But yet they insisted on having less than the best. Get a hold of that. God always has our best intentions in mind. He always has the best plan for our life. He always has the best plan for the church. He has the best plan for His children. He has the best plan for the nation. He has the best plan for everything. But yet we always... little pride creeps up in our life. We always think we know better. You better watch out. 
Because God will eventually give you what you want. And you know, sometimes, sometimes it'll be gut wrenching. As in the case of Moses. Y'all remember Moses back there in the book of Exodus? When he disobeyed the Lord, the Lord told him he wouldn't be permitted to enter the promised land because of his disobedience. You remember what God did to him? Can you imagine this? That was bad enough. He knew he wasn't going to be able to cross. He knew he'd die before that day got there. God told him. And it was all because he was disobedient. But God didn't stop there. He took him up on that hill. And He showed him what he could have had. He showed him what he could have had had he just listened to God. It gets real right there, don't it? Takes him up on that mount, look, Moses. You gotta listen to me. You see all that down there? That could have been yours. Moses even asked him again. Let me go. Let me go. Let me enter. God says, no. No, you can't. And I'm going to be real with you this morning. I don't care if I'm talking about my personal life. It applies to my personal life. It applies to this church. God help us not to ever get to a point in our life where God takes us up on a mountain and shows us what we could have had if we had just killed our pride and listened to Him to begin with. God help us, church, not to ever get to a point. I want what's best. If we go with God, we'll have what's best. God will give us what's best if we go with Him. But we've got to get to a point where we've got to realize that we don't know everything. We don't have all the answers. It don't have to be done every little way that we want it. We've got to pray. We've got to go with the Word of God. We've got to go with the will of God. We've got to be directed by the Holy Spirit. Because I guarantee if we don't do those things, there'll come a point in time when He'll take us up on a mountain and He'll say, you could have had all that. This is what I had in store for you. But you wanted what you wanted. My soul. I'm not willing to settle for less than the best. Children of Israel right here was. There's a lot of churches today that has sold out God for what they think is the best. And I'm not just talking about churches that have put in fog machines and turned it into a big concert every Sunday. I'm not talking about just liberal churches. I'm talking about churches like ours. They're just as guilty because they come in with their little programs. They do their own little thing. They leave God right out of it. And you may not realize it, they would never admit it on the surface. But what they're really doing is rejecting God when those things happen. The Spirit of God is nowhere around. And one of these days, they're going to regret it. They're going to regret it because God's nowhere near it. And God help us never to have a day when God takes us up on a hill and shows us what He had in store for us, but yet our own desires got in our way. God help us. Help us to kill our pride that gets in the way and go on for the glory of God. Move forward for the glory of God. Get our lives right. Get our hearts in check. Go out in the community and see God grow a church. And see God build up something. When God builds it, it'll last. 
When God builds it, it'll be blessed. When God builds it, it'll be good. When God blesses, you'll be happy. God does His work. He does all things well. We don't. Look on here. Look at the specific details. I'm not going to read these verses for sake of time, but God doesn't allow them to walk into this whole thing blindly. He tells them. He prepares them for what's going to happen. They decide to do things their way instead of God's way. He does. God was their king up to this point. God had fought all their battles. God had supplied all their need. God had allowed them to live in freedom, not bondage. But yet in verses 11 through 17, we find that there is a cost to their decision to reject God. In these verses 11 through 17, there's a key passage. He's talking about the king. Six times you'll see a phrase that says this, and he will take. The king is what God's referring to. And He will take. He mentions here that He will He will take your sons. He will take your daughters. He will take your fields. He will take the tenth of your seed. He will take your men servants, your maid servants, your goodliest young men, and put them to His work. And you know what? Six times God says that. You know what number six is in the Bible? It's the number of man. And you know what? That's what man does. Man takes. Man always takes. God wants to give, but man will always take. The Lord gives a fair warning here. You know, most kings are takers. You think about history. You think back through the history books. You think back through the Bible. Most kings are takers. They're not givers. They come to be served. They didn't come to serve. If Israel wants a king, they have to realize that their king will be a taker, not a giver. And they will become His servants according to verse 17. And you know what? Right in the middle of this, i just got to stop for just a second and say thank the Lord because you know what? Not every king is a taking king because you know what? This morning, I know one king that came to give. I know one king that came to serve. The king of kings today is a giving king, is he not? Jesus told us, He said of Himself over in the book of Matthew that even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but He came to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm glad not every king just wants to take, take, take. We serve a king of kings that came to give, give, and give some more. What's Titus chapter 2 say about it? It says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good work. I tell you what, they ain't never been a king like King Jesus today, has there? They ain't never been a king like him. They will never be another king like him today. No, he's a giver. He's not a taker. And I'm thankful for that this morning. Thankful for that. So we see that there's a cost to their decision. Verse 18, there will be a cry because of their decision. Verse 18 says this, Ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye have, have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. He tells them that they're going to later cry out because they wanted a king for unspiritual and ungodly reasons. So God will call this coming king your king. Notice what He says. He says because of your king. See, they rejected God. He's not their king anymore. He makes it clear in that verse that he's the that this is the king they chose. And if Israel waited for God's king, they wouldn't have any reason to cry out, would they? But yet they chose their own. There'll be consequences. We find that in verse 18 again. 
says, Ye shall have chosen you. Look at the last part of it. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. You know what that means very plain? It's very simply God saying, you made your bed, now you're going to have to lie in it. And here's the thing, folks. He's given them all this before they make the decision. He's given them the warning. He's telling them what's going to happen. But then in the last couple verses, we find the stubborn determination. This is what pride will do to us, folks. Look here in verse 19 and 20. Nevertheless, the people refused. What did they refuse? They refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, Nay, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. That's sad. Nevertheless, the people refused. What did they refuse? What did they reject? First of all, they rejected God's Word. That was God's Word in verses 11-17 through 17 that was telling them about the cost of their decision, about the consequences of their decision, about the cry that they would once make in the future if they made that decision. And they rejected His Word. God give them plenty of warning. Verse 18, we find they rejected God's will. You remember, it wasn't God's will for them to even have a king. He was to be their king. The will of God now, He was going to appoint them a king later on. But God was going to be the one that did it. At this time, He was to be their king. So they rejected God's will. And then in verse number 19, I promise I'm almost done. Verse number 19, we find that they rejected God's witness. Who was, the God, who was God's witness? It was Samuel. He was the man of God. He was the messenger. He was the preacher. They didn't care what the preacher said. They didn't care what God said. They didn't care what God wanted. And they didn't care what the outcome was going to be. They were determined to get what they wanted no matter what. My friend, it sounds like a lot of people today. It sounds like a lot of people today. We've got the Word of God. You got the Word of God in your laps right now. You got it in your homes. If you've got the Word of God, and you read and study the Word of God, you know what the will of God is. You got a preacher that stands up three times a week. Countless more on YouTube, Facebook, all the churches going live all over the place. You got a messenger. You got a witness. And yet so many times, God is rejected. We see it all the time. But I want to close, I want to show you something very interesting here. Look in verse number 22. I want to show you something while we finish. I've got back into my old habits on Sunday mornings, and I've done got long winded again. Just trying to mind the Lord. I've had a couple of weeks of some heavy messages. Just trying to mind the Lord here. Look at verse number 22. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. But you notice something really, really significant right there. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. It's almost funny when you think about this. Israel rejected the rule of God. Much like we can. 
much like we have before. I've been there in my life. Much like we see going on around us in our nation. And much like we see in people's lives. Israel rejected the rule of God. Yet hear me out, church. They could not escape it. They rejected God, but they could not escape God. Verse 22 shows it. Because you know who gave the go-ahead to give them a king? It was God in verse number 22. God. Nothing happened without His say-so even though they rejected Him. I think it's amazing. We've got a lot of atheists in our days. We've got a lot of people rejecting God in our days. But can I just say something? God will never, ever, ever, I don't care if it's COVID-19, I don't care if it's Governor Cooper, I don't care if it's Nancy Pelosi, I don't care if it's Black Lives Matter, I don't care if it's every atheist organization in the world, God will never, ever step off His throne. He will never, ever step off His throne. He will always be in rule. I don't care who asks Him to. I don't care who tells Him that He's not real. I don't care who tells Him that He's not in authority. I don't care who rejects Him. God will always be on the throne, y'all. Here's the point though, and I'm done. Here's the point. He'll never step off His throne. Doesn't matter who wants Him off the throne. He'll never, ever step off the throne. But if you resist Him, if we resist the rule of God, we're going to find out that we won't benefit from it the way that we might have. And when we resist God, we're doing nothing but hurting ourselves. That's what the nation of Israel found out in a very hard way here. You'll find it out too in your life. As a church, we'll find it out. If we go against God, we'll find it out. Let's pray tonight. today. Dear Heavenly Father,